Good evening, and welcome to this post-performance talk. My name is Judy Tyrus, and I'm so honored to be the scholar in residence this week, and to be sitting next to this legendary man, founder, artistic director, visionary of Lines Ballet, Alonzo King. Um, so this evening was mind-blowing. Um, what an exquisite range of feelings that you evoke through your choreography, through the music, through the costumes, through the lighting, and then through this, the amazing dancers. I'm just... <sighs> That's how I feel. Um, every, every aspect of the performance was simply astonishing. Thank you so no, much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So you were at the Pillow in 2015, and you were supposed to be here in 2020, but then something bad happened, the pandemic, and uh, everything was canceled for a couple of years. So there's, but there's always this hovering possibility that you'll perform you know, during that time. So I'm just very curious, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you kept the dancers motivated to stay in shape and to keep going because it's I know as a dancer that it's so hard when you're not performing to keep the energy alive. Well I wanted to first of all say that it is an honor to be sitting next to Judy Tyrus who danced for beautifully for so many years with Dance Theatre of Harlem and has produced a book <laughs> about Dance Theatre of Harlem. Thank you. I think one of the uh, things that I admire about artists and dancers in particular is that they want to accelerate the evolutionary process. Even from when they're kids, they want to get to the next level quicker um, so that they can play in the big pool <laughs> with um, as many gifts as they can pull out of themselves. And so when we were not, when we had to come out of our routine, we were really fortunate that we were funded to work in cellular, what is the word that we used to call it? To work in pools where we were protected and there were doctors and we took tests every day, bubbles. And uh, the Mellon Foundation and many supporters allowed us to go to the desert where we could be isolated and work. We even went to um, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco and work. We were outside and had taped areas around us. And so it never stopped because um, of the urgency to keep doing what you do. There's also the idea that, you know, sometimes when the dancer isn't physical, they're playing it in their head, which is a really rich and fertile place where you can live movement visually, and that also is part of the practice, and that aspect became deeper. And so there was, it was a time of work, which was incredible that we were allowed that fortune, but also a time of deep introspection about how ephemeral life is and how do I want to continue? What do I want to bring to the planet and how do I want to depart the planet? Mm. That's so beautiful because I think that uh, your dancers look so far more, uh, so, so much more fulfilled now on stage and so much, they're, they're going so deep into the artistry <laughs> of the work, and yeah. it's just simply amazing. Thanks, Thanks to them. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about this evening's performance. Uh, the four excerpts from the various works that make up Four Heart Testaments were so gorgeous and so different, and yet they fit so well together mm -hmm. um, in, in tone and in spirit. In the first testament in P Pie Yezu, Yes which, if I'm correct, translates to pious or merciful Jesus. 
Uh, the feeling that came over me was, was that they were searching and finding and honoring peace and that everyone finds peace in a different way. Yes. Um, am I on track? <laughs> you know, what I say about that is that people have to, well, let me say it this way, that the author is not the last word and that people have to possess the work themselves not go to a docent, but to trust their intuition and to disagree and say, this is what I see and this was my experience. And you can't say no to that. You have to say, yes, that's so interesting. I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. And that's how it should be, that everyone possesses what they see. You know, it was um, Chopin who heard Liszt in the other room playing his music and he said, oh my God, listen to what he's doing. And so that aspect is the, the viewer's creative aspect. That that interpretation, how they see it, what it touches in them is personal and unique and valid. Mm. <laughs> wow. So, and the, all of the excerpts, they just went together so well. How did you, how did you know? How did you select them? <laughs> I think it's called choreography. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, you, your choices are just so amazing. Thank you, Judy. Yes, yes, yes. So the first time the company appeared at the Pillow was 22 years ago, and your company has, your company has most certainly evolved, <laughs> and so have you. Can you talk a little bit about your evolution and how, how you see yourself in the future? Um, I would say that I don't feel that I've evolved enough <laughs> and that outside of the work, I think you're looking at yourself as a human being um, or as spirit encased in a fleshly form. And in that, you want expansion, you want escape from the prison of the body, you want to pull, you want to pulverize anything that's limiting you until you are free. And I think that that is incarnations of work. <laughs> and so I do think that effort makes change. And with effort, we there's progress. And so I only want to continue to extend that effort because the, 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 the human being, what we call the human being, really wants to get garbage out of the way so that the muse can enter. And so a lot of the work is about cleaning. <laughs> so there's nothing clogging, you know, the the inspiration to be filled with spirit. And so the, the wise ones say that the, the vessel has to be empty for the muse to enter, and that's work. Yes, because your dancers all, all come with, obviously, this physical body that works well, you know, obviously, at a highly tuned level. Yeah. But they also come with the mental strength yeah. and spiritual strength to do this work that you ask them to do. That's true. It's true because the, um, often people think it's the body, but it's the mind and the heart that are playing the instrument of the body that we all have in common. And I like to think of it as there's a glove and the glove is the body, but the spirit enters the glove and animates the glove. And so these five fingers are represented in the five, the five pointed star of legs, arms, and head. And so what animates them, there's a, glove, there's a hand in that glove that's moving them. We were talking earlier about the, hum, us humans are all multicolored bulbs all over the planet. But what is singular and in common underlying us all is the electrical current. And so the bulb without an electrical current, it's just a bulb. 
And so that animation of enthusiasm, of spirit, of will, of devotion that animates its electrical current. Mm. Well, the lights. <laughs> That's right. The lights and the peace, yes. Yeah. Um, and Azov. Yes. Uh, so multifaceted. The music incredible and beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm always curious about the process, um, how, how the music is one thing and the choreography is another thing, and then, and it's all together, it comes together. Can you tell us a little bit about your process of bringing it all together? I will, but you're not gonna like the answer. Uh, <laughs> because the, because it's not literal, is what I mean by that. The, mm -hmm. the, in creation, so much intricacy is thrown out. There's so much difference. And yet, in that ocean of difference, there is the effort to form unity, wholeness, another word, balance, and harmony. And so again, all of this difference just thrown out in these multifarious forms, and yet something is placed in them that wants to return from where they were thrown out. They want to travel back through, from the ocean through the tributaries where they originated to get back home. And so that is salmon swimming upstream. That is the visit back to the parents. That is the desire for wholeness and harmony. And so it's the projected out and its desire to return is working all the time. And, and what we do when that begins to happen, you see, oh my goodness, there's no difference when you can really see, and music and movement are the same, the same. And when we acknowledge that, and then we go to deeper levels and realize that person who I didn't like is me. Mm. And her and him, it's me, it's us. And so you melt back into oneness. And that's really the goal. And so in all works, you see that search for harmony. There's the, <clears throat> the, the, the imbalance of the classical ideal and the romantic ideal, battling and then seeing that they're one and then merging in and out. You cannot have a work that's completely classical or a work that's completely romantic. It's the balancing act. And that balancing act for forces us to see in ourselves, where's the division? How can I bring that into balance? Where's my Adam, where's my Eve? Where is my reason? Where is my feeling? How can I bring that into balance and harmony and wholeness? So that's life's play. <laughs> that is life's play. Yes, and <clears throat> the tears streaming down my face at the end, I really felt that in the piece. It was it just every emotion, every human feeling was there. Thank you. That's great. So I'd like to ask, uh, are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to ask? How do the dancers work and get, get to this place where you want them to be? And how, how does it happen? Is that your question? <laughs> okay. So the dancers are first of all brilliant. They're intuitive. They, what we're talking is soul language and they're stepping into my consciousness. You can do one shape millions of different ways. And so they look to not only the shape, but what was the epicenter? What was the mood of the body before the shape emerged? What was the director's feeling? And they, they jump into that. It is, um, it's, a, it's a wisdom and it's also a compassion because it means that they have to drop for a second their brilliant thoughts and their ideas and really step into the director's blueprint. And that 
supposedly invisible blueprint they detect through smell, through vibration, through the angle of a head, through the through the musical stress or lack of its emphasis. And so they are reading a language that they've been doing their whole life. You know, looking at shapes coming from a body, interpreting those shapes, inhabiting those shapes. And those shapes, when you hold them, they bring meaning. If I frowned, a fake frown, for a long time, I would have a concomitant mood come up in my consciousness and bring me down, because that is inherent in that expression. Mm. If I do a smile, and even if it's fake, and I hold it for a while, mirth starts to arise, and you giggle. And so it's the same thing in any shape you take. They're listening to it. What feelings does it bring? What does it mean? Because it is language, right? And so I'm fortunate to have those kind of artists yes. to work with. And they're also eager to build the house together. Are you looking for music first or for choreography first? I um, am always looking for composers and I'll take names if you have any. <laughs> uh, it's just a constant. And I, as I said earlier that um, We've been fortunate to work with some of the most brilliant composers, and we work together. Uh, music, how do I say it in a different way? Movement and sound are the same. In indigenous cultures, you play the instrument, then you get up and you play the other instrument. And so they're both instruments, and you play them. You have to blow into a flute, you have to strike the piano, you have to hit the drum, it's movement. So movement and sound are the same. When I work with dancing artists, I can see their music if there's no sound on, and I can see the lack of. And so I don't see them as different, but to answer your question directly, if I need a new ballet, I, yes, I'm desperate for music, because what is music? It's the partner. It's the, it's the other half of the relationship. It's the, it's, the, it's the Adam to the Eve. It's the logic to the feeling. It, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Can you expand on your feeling of the choreography? The meaning and the forms related <laughs> to the idea of Mercury. I would say it's really difficult to see a ballet once and get it. Some people do, but it takes time, especially something so different. And so often, I'm gonna speak frank, often we're looking for meaning and the meaning is hitting us in the head if we stop thinking. It's tricky. We're taught to think. What is the logic here? And, and of course, that is laced all the way through it. But I think another entry port is to relax and feel. To relax and feel. In dancing, we execute with will and we relax and feel. We do both. There is um, uh, the, the idea of the driver who's behind the steering wheel, who knows the directions and who is the doer. If you stay with that, it gets dull. That has to be put aside, although useful, and then you become the passenger, and you're not the driver. And that means that you allow that electricity to dance you, and you get the ego out of the way. Understanding things can be instant, it can be felt, and not able to be expressed, but deeply felt, and words can kind of tarnish it. When people have deep experiences, that should be kept private. It comes into the world with doubt and tarnishing and other people's stuff on it, and so it's a really personal place. No, I, I love your question because everything in life is conveying a meaning. Everything, trees, plants, relationships, crea creation, construction, architectural, and the truly educated mind knows what each thing is conveying. 
It's incredibly personal. Incredibly personal. And so the summation is that meaning is experiential. You experience it. You, you let go and experience it. Well, on that note, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Alonzo. Thank, you, thank you so much for coming this evening and enjoying the performance.